Welcome to my series continuing to look at Russ Miller's 50 Facts versus Darwinism in the Textbooks. This is part 13. I will uh, get started here. We're going to talk about homology. Here's a college book. They show the drawing of a whale's flipper or the forelimb of a dog or a horse or a cat and the forelimb of a human. And they say, look, kids, they all have two bones in the forelimb proving they evolved from a common ancestor. Well, I'll admit, that's the most impressive supposed proof that they have. I'm glad to see that Russ Miller admits that homology is, is really good. He says it's the best, but it's really good evidence for um, common descent and evolution. I do want to add, however, that it's a little more complicated than just two bones in the forearm. Um, it's this whole structure of a single bone, two bones, um, there's the carpals and metacarpals, and then the phalanges, uh, five finger design that we see throughout modern tetrapods and even in um, the lobe fin fish. We see the same pattern appearing. And more important than just the bones themselves is also the muscles and, and uh, accessory structures. But also on a genetic level, we see that these same genes, um, by, by interrupting certain genes, we can actually change how limbs develop. Um, we change a gene and only the humerus develops. And the, we change a gene and only um, the, the radius and ulna develop. We change a gene and the fingers get longer or shorter. These, these, these genes, and we find it's the same genes that regulate throughout tetrapods. Now, again, this doesn't discredit the idea that it's a common designer. But couldn't I also say that they have similar bone structure because they have the same designer? Absolutely. I drive a Chevy pickup truck and my next door neighbor drives a Chevy van and their dashboards are identical. It's not because they evolved from a moped. All right, Russ's crappy joke aside, and and ignoring the fact that um, it's pretty poor to compare things that don't reproduce with things that do reproduce, um, and that those arguments have been made many times. Um, but I want to look at this. I want to sort of take what he said seriously um, and use it as well as a tool to sort of get at this question. Um, can we, you know, what what comparison can we make between um, a system? his truck that we know is designed, and a living system, um, a, a lineage uh, that we don't know if it's designed or not. We suspect it's not. But is there anything that we can apply, any, any clues to how those things differ? Um, and I was thinking about this, and I found, I was just searching online, and I'll put a link down below again uh, to a web page I found, um, it's on ask.com, where they show major innovations in Ford trucks. So, this is a lineage of Ford trucks starting from Henry Ford's first truck in 1900 um, to 1925 when the first mass-produced pickup truck appears um, up to, you know, all the modern innovations that were added added to them up into the 21st century. And you can line those up. And I think Russ would agree. You could take his truck and the year before and the year before. And you could line those up going back to 1900 and see a relatively unbroken lineage of relatively small changes in between. Um, very analogous to if we could line up, say, the reptile to mammal lineage. Um, reptiles, synapsids, and we could line those up. Now, Russ would argue that, that that lineage is artificial and such, and that just like the trucks, they were each individually created, you know, no relationship to each other. They didn't give rise to each other. But we can still line them up and, and look at the two and see how design how a lineage of design compares to a lineage uh, that's potentially not designed. Um, and one of the things that we can see in the truck lineage is let's pick headlights. Um, now headlights, you know, the headlights went through a number of, of er innovations early, you know, pre before World War II, a bunch of different designs because there's a problem with designing a, a light bulb that the car could power or that didn't require its own battery. Um, or a, a, um, a means of charging itself and such that would last long enough to be of any value whatsoever. You don't need headlights that are going to burn themselves out every 10 minutes. Um, you need a headlight that's going to be continuous if you're going to be driving at night. So you see headlights go through these innovations of where, you know, headlights hooked up to the um, steering wheel so that when you turn the wheel, the headlights turn, headlights that are um, fixed, mounted, headlights that are sealed, headlights that have changeable bulbs, all of these major innovations in headlights um, but when we look at this truck lineage and we see where these appear, all of these major innovations, improvements in headlights appear, if we were to compare that to other lineages of automobiles, Chevrolet trucks or Chevrolet cars or um, 
you know, any, any Cadillac cars, any make and model of car you can think of, what you see is that an innovation begins in one of those and then immediately appears simultaneously throughout all of the, the same throughout these lineages i.e. say Cadillac enveloped, developed this first headlight system that was really efficient suddenly Chevy also that year uh, put the same structure in place and so did Ford and so did every other car company same thing with seat belts same thing with airbags same thing with anti-lock brakes same thing with all of these other other innovations we see them appear simultaneously across multiple lineages and more important than just appear, um, they're manufactured by the same company. The same, it's not just the same headlight design, it's the same make and model and part number of headlights appear, even if there might be different sh shapes in the housing and such that are unique to the model that you're looking at. Okay, as an, as an analogy to these headlights in the cars, um, let's take a look at eyes. Okay, eyes are a great idea, they're a great innovation. You would expect that the first thing that had eyes had a huge advantage over everything else, right? It's prey. Prey wouldn't stand a chance. It's prey can smell you, feel your vibrations. You can see it. Um, your predators, how are they going to catch you, you know? It's like greased up deaf guy. You're never going to catch me. They have no chance of getting you. Um, but so what, what we would expect to see is we see an eye develop and then we see predators prey lots of things an arms race of sight and we look what do you know there it is we see an arms race of sight we see lots of different things developing eyes um just like we saw all the cars developing headlights right the lineages of cars each independently coming up with head or not independently but each coming up with headlights so we can compare the two are these eyes the same if same designer right designer is going to put an eye on a trilobite it better put an eye on the trilobite's prey, right? It better put an eye on the trilobite's predator so that, you know, leveling the playing field, making this ba a balanced system. But the eyes are all radically different. The trilobite uses a single fixed mineral calcite crystal as a lens. Um, it works. It's, it's very good. Um, it's not as good as the protein, basically soft crystal that we see in... in well, the, like the early fishes, the early vertebrates, um, we see an eye already, an eye there, not already, an eye present um, that has that seems to use the same system as modern vertebrates do, even if it was a pretty pretty basic system. Uh, we see other arthropod types, these lobopods and things, um, using a variation of the compound eye that probably used the same kind of chitinous lens system that we see in modern arthropods, but we don't see in trilobites. Um, so we see variations of this. You would think that a designer would stick to a design, um, you know, and, and be, we would see this repeat design suddenly appearing. And instead we see eyes developing from skin cells. We see eyes developing from brain tissue, from actual, you know, brain tissue close to the surface of the skin where the brain itself develops light-sensitive patches. Um, we see, in some cases, eyes developing on the tips of the legs, um, and these eyes, each of the, the organs that these eyes are closest to, derived from tissue-wise, are not the same kinds of tissue types, okay? Um, you see from nervous tissue versus um, skin tissue, which do have a common origin. Um, but we see in these in sea stars and things, echinoderms, the eyes develop from tube feet, which are have no relationship whatsoever to, to the skin cells. Um, and very, very different parts that, that make sense if you order these things uh, from an evolutionary standpoint, but it doesn't make sense from a design standpoint. So hopefully that made sense as a way we can compare uh, a designed lineage and compare it to. And if you look at look at the automobile lineage, look at the same thing. It's not just headlights. Look at seat belts and all of the other things that came about. Okay, and think about their think about other useful structures. Think of flight in 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 animals. Um, does flight flight's a great idea? Um, but does flight develop using the same? Is there a common design amongst how flight works, or are multiple different structures involved, multiple different variations on the same structure involved with how flight develops? Evolutionists claim that things evolve bigger and better, but the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, says things get worse and worse, not better and better. Jesus, haploid Christ on a fucking bike, Russ. You know, I was starting to enjoy this, this, this little bit of dialogue you were having here, and you fucked it all up. 
evolution doesn't say anything about everything becoming bigger and stronger and better, okay? That's full of shit, okay? And you know that's full of shit. That is a straw man. Again, evolution states that things are surviving, things are passing on their genes, subject to constraints in the environment. Um, they can become weaker and smaller if that is what helps them survive. They can become bigger and better if that's what helps them survive, okay? And also, entropy is about the flow of energy through a system. That's what it's about. It has fuck all to do with the fucking Colosseum eroding, as you're trying to show here. The second law of thermodynamics is sometimes by evolutionists claim to not apply to biological systems. They say that the open system we live in with an unlimited supply of energy coming in from the sun overcomes the law of bio, uh, excuse me, the law of entropy, which makes me wonder well, how did they ever discover it in the first place. But actually raw energy speeds up destruction and leads to entropy. It doesn't prevent entropy. Nobody is making the claim that because the Earth is an open system, that the second law of thermodynamics doesn't apply to us, okay? It does apply to us. I don't know if you don't know, if you're missing the point, or if you're deliberately trying to be misleading to your audience, okay? What it's meant, what's meant by the fact that the Earth is an open system is that we're receiving energy from outside of our system, okay? That energy isn't suddenly being magically transformed and violating the second law. That's not what they're saying at all. What they're saying is that we can take that energy, living systems are taking that energy, or non-living systems for that matter, and that energy is performing work, and the ultimate result of that work can, can result in increased complexity, but at the expense of the, over, the total overall usefulness of the energy involved. I hope that made sense. So if you took this much sunlight and you that sunlight goes into a leaf, that leaf takes that sunlight and water and, and chemical simple elements, converts them to complex sugars, converts them to, to cellulose, converts them to, to, to energy. It stores that energy. Um, there's a certain amount of energy contained in what the plant has created. However, that amount of energy that it's created is less than the energy that went into the system because the system itself was inefficient. Much of that energy from the original sunlight was lost as heat, okay, through evaporation, um, things like that. Through other processes, the energy, the work potential of that sunlight is lost in the system. Entropy continues. Entropy doesn't stop because of it's an open system or because of whatever, okay? You don't, I, hopefully that made sense. Hoping that undirected raw energy is going to improve a system is like pouring gasoline on top of a car and flipping a match on top of it, thinking somehow that's going to improve its gas mileage. Well, it's clear that you actually put a lot of logic and reason and thought into coming up with the analogy of lighting a car on fire to improve its gas mileage um, um, as, a, as an analogy to how we view the sun in an open system on Earth and a, a rising of complexity and, and such. I'm, since you took so much time and... and an effort to put together that analogy, I'm going to answer, I'm going to respond to it um, with an equally carefully thought out response. Fuck you, you douchebag. Dr. John Ross of Harvard stated, the second law applies equally to open systems. The notion is that the law fails for such systems. It is important to make sure that this error does not perpetuate itself. It's the important issue here really is not the energy, it's the information available to the system. It's a matter of information, not energy. Nice quote, my ginger balls. You're, you're, you're getting really good at these. Um, so by saying that, by quoting uh, Dr. John Ross as saying this, um, so do you, do you think what he's really saying here is that there's no order and complexity existing on Earth, that everything's constantly degrading um, and because the Earth's an open system, is that what he's is that what he means here? Is that what he actually believes is occurring, or is it possible that you're completely taking that quote out of context to support your fucked up, stupid, idiotic view of the second law of thermodynamics? 